G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Uh, this video is going to be a bit of a continuation of a series where I'm going to go through individual teams and make uh, an individual profile of what I think of them uh, in terms of where they're at, how 2023 went, uh, how 2024 is going to go, and uh, most notably as well, I'll sort of have a look at their best 22 and make some comments on that. So I'm doing it in reverse alphabetical order, which means I've done a Western Bulldogs one that you can go check out if you're interested, and today it means the West Coast is second. So I'm well aware that I have covered the Eagles in depth this season. I've got my own playlist there called uh, Eagles Corner for Eagles fans. If you're unaware, you can go find that content in a playlist on this channel. Uh, so this is going to be the West Coast Eagles version of the team-based analysis. As such, in this video, I'm pretty much just going to deep dive their best 22 uh, in terms of changes we might see and uh, have a look at their depth as well. So it'll be slightly different to the other ones and I'll do Sydney next and that's where I'll return to the usual format. But in here, we're just going to get straight into the best 22 analysis. This video will also be part of another playlist. So if you want to find uh, you know all the team-based analysis in one playlist, go check it out on the channel. So as a little bit of subtext for for this 22, we also have to consider the landscape West Coast is currently, well, facing right now in uh, in terms of their position in what is going to be a pretty hardcore rebuild. And I think we have seen three years of drafting and uh, recruiting and development relatively go okay. Obviously, the on-field results have been horrendous, but from a youth talent point of view, we're trending in the right direction, which is nice to see. And uh, we also saw um, a stat that I, I did a video recently on list ages and analyzing teams. And West Coast has now the most under 21s of any club in the AFL, which often by itself is not a statistic that indicates you know, guaranteed success, but uh, it does show the work we put in over the last three years. So the awkward point we're in now is just that if we forecast a year with better injuries than we saw in 22 and 23, which has to happen surely, right? Like it's got to happen. Um, then coming up with the best 22 is a little bit awkward because there's a lot of players who kind of impressed this year that uh, might be left out or alternatively veterans coming back uh, that might not have some job security. So I've had a crack at plotting the two 22s, the best 22 and the waffle 22, if you like. And uh, I've decided to be a little bit conservative with it, but we'll analyze it as we go anyway. So first of all, uh, I'm gonna cover notable exits and recruits, uh, not every single exit that we had, but uh, it turns out like a lot of them that got delisted actually played some uh, some football, regular football for us in 2023. So we'll start with the three retirements. Obviously, Shuey and Hearn were best 22 players at the time of retiring and were playing to a pretty good standard. So we have to factor that in as a, as a bit of a short-term loss, even though Shuey obviously had his injury woes. He did play about half a season, I think. Uh, and Shannon Hearn maybe a little bit more than that. Nick Nat's a retirement, but he hasn't featured for much in the last two years. So probably not a huge factor here. And then there was four players that got delisted that uh, actually played uh, some degree of football for us this year. Xavier O'Neill in particular and Sam, Sam petrevsky seaton both players that were more or less in and out of the team for large chunks of the year. So that's a factor. And Luke Foley played a little bit as did Connor West. In terms of the recruits, uh, in when you start with the, the trade acquisitions, Matthew Flynn and Tyler Brockman, you'd think these guys are gonna be, if not guaranteed best 22, certainly in the 25. Two relatively ready-made players. I think Matthew Flynn is 26. And Tyler Brockman, actually, he's only just turned 21, I think. So on the young side, but either way, you foresee that the Eagles rate them around about the uh, the best 22 and should play roles as early as next year. Then there's also Harley Reid to consider. Again, he's a draft acquisition, but we have to be realistic here. There's no way he doesn't play round one if fit, in my opinion. We drafted a few other players, obviously, Clay Hall, Johnston, Reid, Archer, that is, uh, Locke Rawlinson and Cohen Livingston. Out of that group, I'd say the only realistic debut this year is probably Clay Hall. So he's one to consider for depth as well. But let's crack into the 22s. So this is actually a really difficult task because there's so many moving pieces. There's players coming back into the side and we we're forecasting this on perfect availability, which is not going to happen. So the round one lineup will look different to this for sure. And I've gone on the conservative side uh, with the players that have been good over the course of their careers, even if they didn't have a great 2023 or even a 22 for that matter. Um, I've still conservatively put them in this best 22. So we'll go through you know, each line, line by line. Uh, in this particular list, I've got Elliot Yo kind of playing almost as a third tall defender. The other option is Bazo, but uh, it depends on whether Bazo is really banging down the door. I think he could use some time. Uh, developing in the waffle, building confidence. So that's how I would start for round one. There is a temptation to play Yo as a, as a midfielder, but I think uh, splitting his time is probably uh, the way I would go with it. If you look at that back six, obviously the talls are pretty good in Barras and McGovern. Um, at, over the course of the last two years, when fit, both of them have played to a pretty high standard. 
And I think the the leg speed and the rebound is actually okay out of the back half when you consider Cole, Yo, Hoff, and Duggan all have run and carry. And they're all, to different extents, pretty uh, defensively sound. We've seen Brady Hoff do rolls on small forwards. And, um, you know, with the ball in hand, he's also damn good. So that back six with Jermaine Jones on the bench, I, uh, I think has nice attributes there, particularly if Yo can be the third tall defender. In, uh, in most instances. Won't be every game, but we'll see. So then I've picked the uh, the conservative midfield here with Sheed and Kelly, Jinbi, Gaff, and Hunt as the starting division with uh, Elijah Hewitt on the bench. So uh, what I will say is though, because I've picked two rucks in this team, I usually like to have two mids on the bench. So this might be a case of where we get a little bit more rotation from guys like Yo. Maybe Yo rotates with Jinbi. Jinbi can play a bit down back. Harley Reid, who I've got in the forward line there, could maybe switch with Hewitt. And then there's Petrocelli as well, who's kind of been a utility that's played on every line in recent times. So that's the way I would balance that team. Now, I know that there's a lot of Eagles fans here who would like us to start round one without both Sheeda and Gaff. I just don't think it's realistic. So I didn't decide to do that. I think they'll give those players every opportunity to start the season well um, and then go from there, to be honest. But I do think that if the rest of the team improves. Andrew Gaff, for instance, will improve, as will Dom Sheed. Uh, doesn't mean the midfield doesn't have weaknesses as a result. In particular, a lack of defensive running. So Kelly, Sheed, and Gaff are not known for their ability to run two ways. And that's where Jinbi is probably a more important player than we realize with his tackling and his ability to lock down on opponents. We've seen him used sort of as a run with Tagger in 2023, kind of develop his game. Is he ready for the next step to become more offensive? If he does, I do think someone like potentially a Clay Hall needs to backfill that position because he's a good two-way runner. And again, as he's learning the game, maybe he becomes that run with player. But there's a bit of a defensive edge there. But to be honest, I think our, our ability to stop teams transitioning past us and certainly their ability to win the ball out of the center very easily was our biggest problem in 2023. So we'll see how that stacks up. But... Jinbi and Hewitt and now have a, a preseason under their belts. Maybe they can run out games more and, and they're certainly dynamic players, which is handy. So with, uh, like I said, with Flynn on the bench, one less midfield rotation. Um, and I do think that Harley Reid will become a midfield rotation, but I think he starts his career as more of that sort of d deep forward, because I think that's really where he impacts. I don't think he'll be a high half forward, for instance, uh, as some midfielders start their careers. I don't think he quite has the tank. I think he's more of a burst player. He's strong one-on-one -on -one contested situations, so I play him deep. He's a bit of a mismatch. He's not particularly tall, but he's extremely strong. So he will beat tall forwards at ground level and he will beat small defenders in the air because he's so strong. So as an 18-year-old, to have that advantage already, uh, we'll see if he can translate, but I think that's where he plays. And then he'll rotate on ball for stoppages as well. Again, that's where his strengths really are. So the forward line there, you know, with Cripps and Ryan coming back into the side, I do think we've got that dynamic edge back, particularly Liam Ryan. We did see Jamie Cripps play some career best football towards the end of the year. Got three Brownlow votes against the Bulldogs. His defensive running, his ability to run from the center square and be that extra at the stoppage, I think will be really important for, you know, showing the young guys how it's done, to be honest. And Ryan adds some forward line potency that we've probably lacked in his absence. Harley Reid there as well. I don't think he's going to be a massive goal kicker, but again, bit of a mismatch there. And it's a competitive forward line. And uh, there's someone I had to leave out in Jake Waterman, who we'll talk about shortly, that I think probably deserves to start round one because he had a good year last year, but I digress. But there's a nice balance there of defensive pressure, particularly with Cripps. And I think he will be a key pillar that we need to replace in the forward line. Um, getting a forward who can apply defensive pressure, maybe that's something Rawlinson can focus on as bringing his A game and potentially Tyler Brockman as well. So I had Brockman uh, as the sub. I just couldn't quite pick which player um, that I would put Brockman in for. Noah Long came ninth in the best and fairest last year. Again, what I'll say on Long is like he's he's going to be a good forward. I don't think he's going to be a real goal kicker. He's a bit more of a, a playmaker who could probably play that high half forward role. Brockman, I believe, can bring some pressure. And as a sub, I think that's where he gets his first opportunity, provided there's no injuries. Because if there will be, which means he might get a crack in round one. Same thing with Waterman there. He's a real unknown with his, his physical capabilities right now. So he's obviously coming off, what was it, uh, diverticulitis or something like that? Some really horrendous illness. He lost 10 kilos. But if I'm not mistaken, he actually, uh, he either won or got close to winning the um, the West Coast Eagles time trial or equivalent of the time trial. So he's come back in ripping shape, although he has come back a lot slimmer. So I don't know where to forecast Jake Waterman. Is he going to be a high half forward now, like a running Andrew Rembley type who's big but can run all day? 
or is he going to be more of a power forward, undersized key forward, where I think he's probably played his best football. Uh, so that one is going to be a wait and see. Two other unlucky players that I just had outside the 22 were Ryan Marrick and Jack Williams. I think Ryan Marrick should be in this team. I really want him in this team, but I've allowed for the fact that we're probably going to start Flynn. And if we start Flynn in the team, Bailey Williams goes forward. I can't fit Marrick in that team. What I will say as an aside, though, is I wouldn't be mad if we saw Ryan Marrick deployed as a bit of a loose defender in 2024 because I think his field kicking is arguably his best attribute and if he can harness that he can play at AFL level um, as a potential third tall defender he's a bit small to and, and I mean not in height but I mean stature like he's, he's a skinny kid so him being able to lock down a third tall forward for an opposition team is probably a bit of a pipe dream this year but I would love to utilize his kicking out of the back half so maybe his role moves around and Jack Williams uh, probably just unlucky probably goes back to the waffle to continue what was good to development up to this point. So let's look at the reserve 22. And um, obviously I've highlighted the new players in yellow there. Um, obviously the spine looks okay. We've drafted Archer Reed as a key forward. Rhett Bazo and Harry Edwards are solid talents. Although I think Harry Edwards probably needs a big year because he's been injury riddled up to this point. I have heard though that he is looking bigger than ever. So potentially there's been some development there. Obviously in, in previous videos, I've talked about our need for medium defensive types, particularly those with run and carry. And most importantly, probably foot skills. That's probably something I haven't clarified. Someone who can really distribute by foot out of the back half in the same way that Jermaine Jones does. But you know, I think we could use another one like that. And then uh, like I look at Witherden and Rotham in that back six, and I think two players that We'll be lucky to be on the list next year, hence why I have a little bit of a desire to add more running defensive types. What I will say though is Kobe Bergeel is probably one player there that I really expect to debut probably in the first couple of months of the season, uh, provided he gets that hamstring right. The midfield mix is decent. You've got two genuine wingmen there and Luke Edwards and Campbell Chesser. I would start Chesser in the waffle to build some confidence. Obviously, he was thrown in the deep end this year, developed okay, but I'd like to see him consolidate that with some strong waffle form. But I think, you know, looking at that midfield mix, Cully, who starts the season, potentially still recovering from that ACL, even Clay Hall, but Zane True, Luke Edwards, Campbell Chesser. The good thing about all those is provided the injury situation is not crazy, if any one of those gets pulled into the AFL team, I'd have some confidence that they can play a role, which is a nice position to be in um, and where we're not decimated by injuries. I've got Waterman in that forward line. Again, I, I could see him starting round one. Uh, he's unlucky and I think he's a bit of a favorite who gets selected when fit and therefore he probably doesn't belong in this team. But overall, I suppose the other observations are probably just that that forward line is quite raw and it is tall now. Uh, we got Waterman, Reed, Williams and Marrick in that team. Like I said, I wouldn't mind Marrick being explored as a defender first at waffle level and uh, see what he can bring out of the back half there because I think he would really stand out at waffle level. Uh, but in general, like Harvey Johnston, uh, Locke Rawlinson as well, uh, Cohen Livingston. There's a lot of raw forward half talents there um, that we'll need to develop, as well as Tyrell Dewar, who apparently is doing really well in the um, like endurance drills at the moment, which I didn't know was a feature of his game. So potentially we could see a surprise debut from Tyrell Dewar this year after some good form at the back end of 2023. So there you have it, guys. Just some observations on how our 22s uh, st uh, stack up. Obviously, there's the inevitable um, advent of injuries happening. So fingers crossed we have a better run this year. I do think that that best 22 is mature enough and competitive enough and talented enough to way exceed the bottom four. But again, obviously lost a little bit of faith. I think there's going to be some synergy issues. You know, a lot of these players haven't played together on an ongoing basis over 22 and 23. And I'm, I'm concerned about that midfield starting 22. But this is a good opportunity where we might see a very different best 22 for round one to what we see in round 24. Uh, as players develop and get their opportunities. For instance, Ryan Marrick will certainly be in the team by round 24, in my opinion. Bergeel's another shout. Even Campbell Chesser working his way back into the best 22. Waterman probably flits in and out and potentially Clay Hall as well. So we're in a good position now where there's not too much of a gap between the best 22 and the um, you know the reserve players coming in because we've got some availability. There's some depth there. And obviously this is all relative. There's not depth compared to Melbourne's team, but it is looking a lot better and potentially more competitive than it did over the last 24 months. So there you have it, guys. Let me know in the comments section of what your opinions are and uh, what you agree with and disagree with. As always, I uh, thank you so much for the support. I will continue both footy and cricket content for as long as you guys keep watching. And uh, for now, I'll say goodbye. But thanks, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.